I introduce Tom, I would like to highlight some things we have to look forward to in this very crazy year. Uh, we have the uh, Joan Walkovic Memorial Lecture in conjunction with the Scott Arboretum featuring Doug Tallamy, and that will be in January. We also have the seed exchange as um, was mentioned by Sandy. And in March, on March 20th, we have March into Spring Symposium uh, with Ken Drews, Tom Christopher and Kim Ironman. Um, please join us for that. We also will have a corresponding um, silent auction. Um, so we have lots of things and there might be some pop-ups. So don't forget to look at the calendar on the website. I also wanna remind you to use our chat feature to ask questions uh, and which uh, Tom will answer at the end of the lecture. So now I would like to introduce Tom. Tom is the executive director of Jenkins Arboretum. And as a native of Pennsylvania, he grew up exploring and gardening within the wild woodlands of the north central part of the state. His degrees are in environmental studies and urban horticulture. In his professional career, Tom has had, has had leading horticulture positions at botanical gardens and urban public parks in Boston, New York City, and Louisville, Kentucky, including the position of horticulture director for New York City's High Line. As the executive director at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens in Devon, Pennsylvania, Tom is working to connect people to the beautiful, naturalistically designed gardens with their abundant and diverse collections of rhododendrons and native plants. And without further ado, also don't forget to visit Jenkins, which is a delight in any season of the year. Tom. Thank you so much, Janet. And thank you to the Hardy Plant Society for inviting me to come speak today. It's a great pleasure and a great admiration of the Hardy Plant Society. I've been fortunate to speak to other member organizations and chapters, um, uh, other places I've lived. And always, you're always an enthusiastic group of, of gardeners, um, often uh, making me, putting me to shame, uh, even though I put my, I've dedicated my career to it. So, uh, but it's a real pleasure to be speaking to you today. I'm gonna share my screen now. So just give me a second to get my talk up and running, and I always forget to hit this one button saying share screen. Um, and then uh, on the side, wh wherever your, your cartoon strip of speakers is, you can eliminate that or just show my head. So you can use that. Um, there's a little like icons at the very top there and you can do however you find best. Um, it's always a little weird. I've done a couple of these Zoom talks and they're always a little bit weird and, um, and doing them because you're trying to, you know, usually you're in a large room, you're speaking to people in person. Uh, in fact, you would have been here at Jenkins today if we were able to fortunately do this in person. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to have that sort of feedback with people as you're speaking, sort of probably like an actor or a comedian has with a live audience. So um, uh, please forgive me if I feel I, I, I'm trying to go through it as best I can, but, um, but I do appreciate this chance to speak to you. Um, uh, as I, as, if you haven't been to Jenkins, I do welcome you to come here. We are still very lovely. This was earlier this fall. This was a beautiful picture, and I'll be talking more about these kinds of plants out there. But I first, I thought I'd sort of talk about a couple of things. I first thought I'd introduce myself and then sort of move into talking about some cool things for the winter and then move into talking a little bit more about Jenkins again. Um, I've worked for a long time in horticulture and horticulture management, um, almost all for nonprofit organizations. So I've worked in a variety of conditions. I've held the plants, I've drawn the drawings, I've led groups and um, great teams and variety of different places around the country. And as Janet mentioned in my, in my, in my introduction, uh, I started out with a degree in environmental studies, which really gave me an appreciation to understand the environmental movement. And I, I feel so centered, I feel like horticulture has such an important um, piece of it. And I hear you're gonna have Doug Tallamy speak to you a little bit later this year, this upcoming year. And he's somebody who speaks very passionately about how we can use plants to improve our world, our environment and our habitat for species. 
And I believe these leaders were really starting to look at it. But what I find really interesting here, and this is where I come back to it, is um, that New York Central Park was established even before we had national parks established. So for a long time, we've been thinking about um, park spaces as places for people, but you know, more importantly, those are green spaces for people, uh, for critters and people. Um, even though I have a, a strong environmental background, I also have a very strong uh, ornamental horticulture background. I was very fortunate enough to study as a one year intern at Longwood Gardens many, many decades ago, but it was a great opportunity to uh, learn about the sort of more formal horticulture. And I've always loved the diversity that horticulture does. And, um, and also in my introduction, Janet sort of briefly described um, some of the places I've worked. I've worked in a lot of different places, um, been a bit of a, a, a mover rounder in some ways, but feel very fortunate that all these different places have given me an opportunity to experience and understand different forms of horticulture. And I'm going to touch briefly on that. I'm going to focus almost entirely on this talk on Jenkins because I, I wanted to speak about the glory, gloriness of our gardens. And maybe that wasn't the right kind of wording to use, but opportunity. But all these places built up to understand something. Many of you may recognize, I'm just going to point these out, Native Plant Trust is in um, outside of Boston. It's a garden very similar to Jenkins, but it solely focuses on native plants of the New England region. Um, it's in a town called Framingham, just due west of Boston. The Rose Kennedy Greenway is famously on top of the Big Dig in Boston, in downtown Boston. It's a green ribbon of parks that runs through the downtown area. Um, the High Line, if you're not familiar with it, probably one of the more famous projects here. Um, it's a old abandoned train bridge that was converted into a green park. Uh, and it runs for about a mile and a half on the west side of Manhattan and then in New York. And then the Parklands of Floyd's Fork is located just on the edge of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it was a little bit of a new sort of direction for me to go all the way down there, but it's a 4,000 acre park um, that just opened in um, uh, 2000 and was this 2014. So very, very new park and, um, uh, something that this country's not been doing a lot of is opening very large parks. And then we're going to be talking more about Jenkins today. But through all this, and I think this is really important if, as we think about our home gardens, as we think about public spaces, Frederick Law Olmsted, who's pictured here, um, he always said, you know, these things, these aren't by accident. What we design is not by accident. It's really a result of intentional and complex design, right? We, we're, we're, we're doing something very intentional. You do that in your yard and your landscapes. We do this in our parks and our botanic gardens. We're creating a very intentional system. And especially in this day and age where we have so many unfortunate um, invasive species that are rampant, we even have to be intentional about how we manage our natural areas nowadays. So, um, you know, really being intentional how we take the steps and understand the systems. And of course, he was one, he was the man who was uh, one of the people who helped design Central Park in New York City. And that's become a phenomenal place, not just for people to engage, but also uh, for that sort of slice of, of ecology life in that area. And here you can see in this aerial shot, I mean, that's pretty significant amongst all that concrete. So, you know, these are, these are important little spaces. Uh, I think one of the greatest environmental um, uh, disasters we have and we don't talk about is uh, is natural land fragmentation and you know not to make this whole talk about environment but it, it's definitely something you'll hear more out of um, Doug Tallamy as he talks about how do we knit our landscapes together so we reduce this impact of fragmentation but I also like to think of it from a people perspective our gardens our parks our ways that if they're well designed, are gateways for people to engage with nature. Now, all of you have already are inducted in this um, idea that nature and plants are wonderful, but there are a lot of people in the world who are still afraid of going outside of a shopping center or leaving the concrete of a sidewalk. And so I think when we can create really magnificent gardens, it's a chance for people to sort of slowly edge in those directions. And I feel like Jenkins is a very important part of that experience. 
Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens is um, we have about 15 acres that's open to the public. This sort of cartoon drawing sort of gives you a little bit of perspective of it. Uh, to the far left of your screen, it says parking. That's actually where our education building is. Um, that's where we would have met today if we were meeting on site. But uh, this is where um, this is at the top of the hill. And we are a bit of a hill site where you go slope down. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Our pond is at the bottom of the hill. And then we have a nice sort of ridge here. I'm actually right here right now. This is the Jenkins house. I'm very fortunate to have um, to live on property. But the Jenkins house is um, our um, namesake, uh, the owner, the original owners of the property and their home. So we use that today for small events and um, I fortunately have a residence there. As I mentioned, we're about 15 acres open to the public, but we actually hold about 46 acres. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about our master plan process that we're going to be looking at opening up more acreage to the public in the future. Uh, we are a free public arboretum and gardens. Um, like many of the places you're familiar with, you walk in, you, um, you pay an admission fee and then go through a gate and then you're in the garden. That's wonderful. Those institutions have built that model and, um, and it helps support their revenue. We've really, we still are very dependent on our community to support us. We do not have one of the amazing sort of endowments that fund everything for us. But um, what was very important to the board and this organization very early on that we try to be free to the public so people can come and enjoy us for whatever length of time or whenever they wanted to. So we try to open, we open right now at 9 a.m. in the morning and we close around sunset or nightfall, which right now is a little about quarter till five. We do have membership and we also probably to all of you who are excited about plants, we do have a plant shop on site. Um, it's open from April until October, and that will be, um, we're looking for it, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Here's the Jenkins House. It was built in 1926 to 1928. It's a very, very nice, large, spacious house, um, and we're, we're reworking the gardens around it now. Some of you may have known Harold Sweetman. He actually resided in this house and um, was very uh, instrumental in creating a lot of the collections that we have in the Arboretum today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had Mr. Jenkins. Um, really, Mr. Jenkins left this property in memory of his wife, Elizabeth Philippe Jenkins. Um, it was because of her love of nature is why he left the property. Uh, she was the one who walked around the property, loved to study the animals that were in here, the plants that were on site. And she passed sadly before him, but he um, really felt they didn't have any children or any heirs. So he decided he wanted to leave it as a public space. So we've been We've been open since 76, but really it's been sort of known to be set aside since uh, late 68. We also have a gift, a land gift and a home um, given to us by uh, Mrs. Uh, Browning. Uh, Louisa Browning gave her property in 1971. And so this is the property I mentioned that's not been open to the public. We've used this mostly for private uh, uh, operational work, but we're looking to open some of it open to the public in the future. Um, and I mentioned the sweet Mr. Uh, Harold, Dr. Harold Sweetman, who's pictured on the bottom right. Um, and his father was actually the first director here. And both of them really set a, a strong legacy of almost um, 40 year legacy of building this garden up from nothing. Cause there really wasn't any garden. The Jenkins didn't leave a garden. They just sort of left a property and a house so the gardens have really been built up since that time. Um, and we have a wonderful community of people. We're a nonprofit organization. Um, we have a wonderful community of people who come out. This picture was taken last year, fortunately before this pandemic. And um, here they were building a large wreath, which we're gonna be building again this week, but we're being, doing it in a very different style. We won't be able to take this kind of picture this year, but um, we're excited to still be able to build the wreath and have people come and enjoy its beauty. So I welcome you to come check it out. It'll be, I think what's this coming Saturday is the 12th. Um, so you can come see it on the 12th and we're even gonna light it this year, which should be a lot of fun. We're, um, just making sure I keep time. Where um, many of you may know this or may not know this, we actually are a true botanic garden or an arboretum. We have a collection, a, accredited collections of rhododendrons, azaleas, and mountain laurels that are accredited through the American Public Gardens Association. 
Um, and we also have a significant collection of native species. And we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, this is the collection map here. Um, it looks like all those little dots that look like ants there is a plant. It has a accession number affiliated with it. It's tracked in a database. Um, if it's alive, if it's healthy, if it's not healthy, if we're going to propagate off of it. Um, so this is how we organize everything. And this is the map visual version of it. So it's, it can be quite, it's quite interesting to look at this map and think how we spread everything all over the place, but really fascinating. Um, as I said, we're famous for our rhododendrons. This is a small leaf rhododendron, which typically blooms in, this is an early blooming rhododendron, which blooms, I think it blooms usually in um, April. Um, a lot of our small leaf rhododendrons do bloom in April. Most of the rhododendrons uh, peak in um, mid-May, um, with the azaleas peaking in late April and early uh, in May, and early May. So it's quite we are definitely known as a spring garden in that sense. Um, but as I mentioned, we have a lot of native species. I'm just showing you a very, very small subset, but this is erythronium trout lilies or dog tooth lilies, depending on how you like to um, use the common name. But um, we just have this beautiful sweep of them and it's really quite fascinating. I've never seen them this dense before, but it's quite fascinating uh, for them. Uh, and then we even have bloodroot. I mean, I know these things aren't super unusual, but I, I every year I just be, I, they just put a big smile on my face, which I, I still just love these plants. And I love even when I get to go hiking and find them in the wild, which, you know, there's just, they just have this small window of opportunity to see them because they literally, some of these plants just bloom for like a day or a few days at a time and then they're gone and they're done for the year. Here's the double blood root, which actually its flowers last much longer, uh, probably because they're not pollinated, but um, really a phenomenon. We have a lot of dub double blood root here. It must, uh, it grows really well. We have a nice, um, a nice uh, acidic soil here, which I think the blood root really enjoys, and um, is why our rhododendron azaleas and mountain laurels grow so well for us. One of my favorite, and I can't talk about spring without talking about trilliums, but really enjoy that we have a lot of different trillium species. And some of these plants, as we build up their collections, may apply for accreditation of these collections as well someday in the future. We, I mentioned earlier the beautiful pond area. Um, here you can see our pond, but this year, I'm not gonna to talk too much about it, but this year we got beat up a lot by the storms. We had that horrible storm in June. It was a derecho, which just, Took down, it took down over 60 trees down um, throughout our property in the non-public areas and the public areas. And you can see here in the pond, there's a log sitting there. That was a cottonwood that came down during that storm. But it was sort of fun. Um, here's, here's down when, in the storm when it was ripped up out of the ground. I mean, it's just fascinating to see how these roots ripped out, even took, they were under the the bench, the chairs there, and just ripped them out from underneath those chairs. Uh, quite fascinating. We had an arborist come in, remove the root plate, and leave the log and take some of the branches off of it, leave the log in the pond, because we thought, what a wonderful opportunity for the wildlife to enjoy it. So we've seen turtles on there. We had some migrating ducks that spent a few days in our pond and uh, hung out on the, on the log. So that was a lot of fun to see. And, you know, the people enjoy it thoroughly. So that's been a lot of fun. And I, as soon as I came here, I was like, we need a log in a pond. And well, unfortunately, nature found a way to provide it to us, but I'm glad we were able to leave it there and, and utilize it. And like I said, we had a wonderful fall here. And it was really a beautiful fall. This is that same, almost same shot of that pond area. Um, even though we're very colorful and have a lot of blooms in spring, I found Jenkins to, this has been my first year at Jenkins. So I found Jenkins fall to be really phenomenal and equally as colorful. And that's usually about mid to late October is when we see that color. It was quite phenomenal this year. This is Jenkins right now. So a lot of um, naked deciduous trees right now. Um, and this is what I wanna talk a little bit about. Um, we, of course, we're entering into winter. Um, our winters tend to be very brown around here. We don't often get a lot of snow like this. This is beautiful when it happens um, and quite glorious. But you know, as you know, living in this area, these things don't, this doesn't always last. It melts very quickly. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the plants 
cats that I think are really fun. And these might sound like they're familiar friends to you or, um, or some new things to you, but I thought I'd just sort of share and talk a little bit about some of the other plants that make color in our gardens. Um, I don't know how many of you, and unfortunately I can't see a raise of hands, but this has been a really fun plant for me, the Easton tea berry, the Galtheria procumbens, nice red berries right around this time of year. In fact, when I, I used to do um, containers for uh, private homes and I, instead of always using winter berry, I sometimes would buy some small plants of, or some robust plants of this with the berries on it and use this in containers even. Um, and then I could transplant it out later on and put it in the garden. So always a fun plant. This is a, you know, this plant probably grows just, um, if it's lucky, gets uh, six inches tall in the garden, but really fun and fortunate. Of course, winterberry, which is very popular. This might be a cultivar of red sprite. The cultivars tend to hold their fruit much longer. I think they just don't have the sugars or they um, are really not as edible as the, what we call the, just the straight up native strains, the non-cultivars. Those tend to get stripped very fast. Uh, much more edible. So um, I sort of like to grow both of them, um, have these sort of cultivars in the front foreground where I want to see them and enjoy them and then plant some of the more native, um, uh, more native strains or native selections um, more in the back part of the garden where I can enjoy the berries when they're there, but then the birds and the squirrels and other critters can enjoy them as equally as well. Um, choke cherry, a lot of the choke cherries have actually now have dropped their berries, but just a, even a few up to a few weeks ago, they were still on. Um, I always joke, uh, some years ago, Trader Joe's, if you're familiar with that grocery store chain, was actually selling what they called aronia juice. And I thought it was quite funny that they were using the Latin name or the genus name instead of the common name for this plant. I guess choke cherry juice would have not been a very good sales pitch um, for a juice. Uh, it is very tart juice, very similar to cranberry juice. And you can buy, there's a um, the aronia uh, a butifolia, um, which is the red one. And then there's also a um, uh, one that has black fruit on it as well. The American Wahoo. Um, this is a plant I didn't know much about many years ago and, and started growing it. Uh, we have a lot of it here at Jenkins. It's very happy growing here. In fact, it seeds around a little too much. Um, I love these little sort of winged uh, fruits and they have a bright little orange um, fruit in there. If you were going to propagate this, you would pull that little orange uh, fruit out um, out of it and, and probably scarify it. I've not propagated this myself, but, I, uh, but I've seen birds just sort of go around. They pick the orange fruit right out of this sort of pod and leave the pod on the tree. In fact, um, let me see here. I didn't put it in here. I had, whoops, now I've gotten ahead of myself. But um, this is now, the leaves are all off the bush and the pods are still on it and so they provide this interesting sort of pink hue in the garden uh, which has been a lot of fun. Beauty berry it can be a lot of fun as well uh, especially when it drops its leaves and you have those purple uh, berries this one's just sort of changing we took this picture a little while ago and then um, the, um, the magnolias the, um, the southern magnolias uh, this is the Magnolia grandiflora. This is um, beautiful, big evergreen leaves. Sometimes it can be a little problematic to grow up here just because a uh, snow load could break them, but it's a lot of fun to uh, watch them, especially if you get these fruits on them. And then the, spare, the, the fruits literally will hang. They hang like from a string of silk off of them. They're sort of dangling there, waiting for the birds to come and snap them up real quick. Converting over, talking about some of the herbaceous plants, in my garden, I like to leave a lot of the, um, a lot of the sort of brown stems up. And I know that may sound a little funny, leaving sort of stems of, of perennials that have um, gone dormant, but um, there's been a real big movement of doing this. On the High Line, we often did this. And on the High Line, um, 
the designer, the planting designer for the High Line was Pete Udoff. And if you don't know him, um, I encourage you to check out some of his books. He's a Dutch garden designer. He's designed several large, beautiful parks here in the United States, the High Line being one. He also did um, Battery Park in Manhattan as well, at the tip of Manhattan. And he designed the Lori Garden that's part of Millennium Park in Chicago. Um, and he's been working in some other parks in Chicago and Detroit at this point. Um, and he always had a quote saying, well, brown is a color too in the garden. And so we shouldn't um, discourage using that. But I just love this. This is um, the common milkweed, often probably better appropriate for a large sort of meadow type garden than a maybe more small garden bed because it's this, this milkweed runs. The other milkweeds tend to be clump growers. Um, but I just love these seed heads. Uh, I've seen a lot of people do a lot of beautiful ornament art out of them, making Christmas ornaments and things out of even the this, this sort of silk off of the seeds or even using the pods to make sort of, I have a pod that somebody took and glued together and made a star out of, which is really beautiful. But um, I just love this look in the garden. Of course, golden rods are very uh, good. I don't know which species this one is, but I just love how beautiful. Now, if you have the Canada goldenrod, that can be very aggressive. So I discourage growing that one. In fact, if you get one plant, you'll have of 50 in a matter of a quick time. But a lot of the other goldenrods are much more well behaved in the garden. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, asters, the aster species can be a lot of fun. They provide these beautiful seed heads. Sometimes they can be a little um, uh, prolific in the garden if you let them seed. Uh, my staff here at Jenkins Arboretum, we like to cut them back, but you could even take uh, cut back flowers and make a dried flower arrangement or something in the garden. Um, bee balm, beautiful seed heads. And these seeds are providing food for birds. There's a lot of overwintering birds. They like the cover of these stems. They might poke around on the ground and sort of tuck in and out of the um, perennial stems and looking for fallen seeds. Or sometimes if you have goldfinches, they'll actually prop themselves right up on the stem and near the flower head to pick out uh, the seeds. Um, so you have a lot of wildlife using them. Also, you have a lot of um, beneficial insects that tend to be in the layer, the duff layer on the bottom part of this, or even overwintering in the hollowed out stems of these perennials. So they don't hurt the perennial plant themselves, they're just in this, this sort of dyed back stem part, and they just sort of lay their eggs or um, have larvae in those stems that are overwintering. Mountain mints. This is a one of, we grow four or five different mountain mints. Our, uh, one of our past head gardeners loved mountain mint. So we have several of those that um, grow and I love these sort of gray seed heads. Um, purple Joe pie weed, they've changed the Latin name on this. Um, uh, the, uh, you could, uh, I'm not even gonna say it right now. Eucatorium or not, not even, that's not, you uh, Every time I'm in these talks, I always trip over my names. So that's why I put them on the slides for you to view. But I love Joe Pieweed. Now this is a cultivar. There's a little Joe, which is a shorter cultivar than this one. I don't know what cultivar this one is. I took this picture actually at Stonely Gardens. If you know Stonely Gardens, it's part of the um, natural land, natural lands here in Philadelphia area. And it's in, um, next to Villanova University. So not far from here. Uh, us at Jenkins. You could go to Stonely and Jenkins in the same day and have a nice walk around. What I also love about these leaving these perennial stems up is how they catch the snow. And so here's actually a picture on the high line. Um, this I think is a, a one of the larger sort of Coreopsis plants. I'm not, I can't remember anymore. It's been a while since I've been there, but um, I just love how the snow catches in there. Um, even here, the hibiscus, um, the swamp rose mallow, um, this is sort of frozen and then snow stuck for fast to it. But I think it's just really fun and it provides sort of a bold dark texture in the garden. And in the use of grasses in the garden. Now, some people love grasses, some people don't. If you have a more wild garden, it's really important to have grasses because they provide support for the taller perennials. But grasses just provide really fun texture. And that's what we did on the high line. The grasses, even as they were dying back, were so important for the texture and the, and the color of that garden. So it was really important that we left those up there. Um, and like I said, they look so great, depending on the different kind of grasses you have and how they catch the snow. Um, 
it, it can be a lot of fun. And even the sound, I wish I had a video of the sound rustling through. And here I made, I used a Panicum brigadum, which is a pretty tall one. This one was growing a good um, eight to 12 feet tall here. This was at a garden in Kentucky where we used it to sort of wrap around this round bench. So it gave a little bit of a, um, a nice sort of screening for the bench and uh, sort of made the bench feel like it was fitting into the landscape a bit, which was a lot of fun. Evergreens, ever so important in our landscape. Uh, I think sometimes people get a little too carried away with evergreens in uh, winter landscapes and then in the summer, it's like, where are the other leaves and the other leaf colors? But I think you can have a lot of fun with evergreens. Now, rhododendrons tend to be what we call a broadleaf evergreen. So they hold on to their large leaves. They will do some leaf drop. Azalea, the native azaleas and some other azaleas are deciduous, um, so they drop their leaves, but our rhododendrons, so at Jenkins, we have this beautiful play of sort of the, the bare stems and evergreen, broadleaf evergreens with a few ever, uh, other conifer evergreens around as well. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, another ericaceous species species that's related to rhododendrons is Lakothui that we grow here. Um, it almost has this like long dinosaur neck that's how I like to refer to it, especially to kids who love it. Um, but it catches the snow really beautifully. American holly, another, there's a lot of great holly species out there. Um, I love how the snow builds up on it and creates sort of a mounding, especially when it's next to or um, just behind it, something that's a little more sticky like in the snow. You get this sort of more round rounded sort of snow blobs with the um, stickiness of a shrub that would be in front of it. So it can be a lot of fun to layer that. Um, you know, in our forest, we get these sort of beautiful views of these sort of sticks and it's, it's fun to just poke a few sort of evergreens through there that provide some more um, color and texture. There's a few uh, herbaceous plants that are even sort of semi evergreen. A uh, few ferns here, the Goldie's fern, it's still, I just took this picture two days ago, still very vibrant and green, and this will stay vibrant green for a little while. So it provides a little bit of a ground plane green. Of course, more famously known is the Christmas fern. This stays really true green right up until spring. And then spring, these leaves will die back as the new fronds will start emerging. So it can be really beautiful. And then autumn fern, another sort of what I call semi evergreen, which uh, right now, again, two weeks ago, took this picture or just two days ago, took this picture where you get this sort of beautiful um, evergreen on the forest floor. Um, another euonymus, a native euonymus again, is the strawberry bush, euonymus americanus which has these beautiful green branches to it. So it creates this sort of green haze in the landscape, which I really love. You don't get a lot of green branches from many plants and that can be a lot of fun. I'm a huge fan of hydrangeas. Um, and uh, this is the oak leaf hydrangea here. Um, wonderful, it's still holding onto its leaves. Even when it loses its leaves, it looks fine. Uh, I love the flowers. The flowers provide uh, really interesting uh, texture this time of year. I just don't think you can go wrong with growing um, hydrangeas in the landscape because they have these beautiful flowers. Uh, here's another native hydrangea, which is the hydrangea arbor arborescence. Uh, this one's the Annabelle, which has the nice pom-pom or uh, round snowball style flower, which are sterile flowers. So they're not going to seed around, but your, your ones that are fertile flowers are these what we call lace cap style uh, hydrangeas. And this is the lace cap version of the hydrangea arboriescence, which I love this one because it's a flat dome type um, flower. And then you have the sterile flowers on the outside, which is sort of like landing pads for the insects. And then they can pop around and get to the fertile flowers that will provide seeds. So really fun, but I just love the different textures of those. Uh, sumacs can be a lot of fun. The seed heads are fun. This is our fruit heads. Um, you can actually make a lemonade in the summer out of this or late summer, early fall. You can find a recipes online to make lemonade, a lemon, a sumac lemonade out of them. It's also a popular, I think it's when it dries is a popular um, Middle Eastern spice. 
but I love the forms in the landscape as well. Um, I almost think of them as dancers in the landscape. I tend to go in and open up the crown and prune them up, uh, prune them a little more open so that they look like they're waving their arms or sort of uh, uh, dancers sort of flowing themselves through the landscape. And also another plant with sort of beautiful form uh, to it is the bald cypress. And yes, it's, it's, it's what we call a deciduous uh, conifer. Um, its needles will turn color, this beautiful bronze color in the fall and drop. So it's a naked quote unquote evergreen in the winter, but it provides this really interesting texture. Here you can see it um, naked here, but at the bottom, if, especially when growing in water, it produces these what we call knees. And I love the texture of these. So if you have a very wet spot, you could grow these. The, the theory is that these um, roots need air. We, we, one of the impo most important things in soil is actually air components, air pockets. You, that's why we want nice friable soil for our gardens. And in this case, when you have water, there's no air in the, in the soil. So the theory here is that these roots are emerging so that they can catch a little bit of air into the root system. But I think they just make these fun um, forms in the garden, which can really be neat. And then leaves. Um, some of our immature trees, uh, such as American beech, and even some oaks do this when they're still immature, will hold on to their leaves. And the American beech can be a lot of fun because they create this sort of, um, the very bleached sort of uh, parchment paper style leaf as a, on the winter. And then in the spring, as the new leaf buds start swelling, they'll push these old leaves off. So you get that really nice, beautiful rustle all winter. Um, and of course, leaves are just really neat. These are, um, the large leaf um, magnolia, deciduous magnolia, native one that's dropped its leaves. This is magnolia ashii. It's got this beautiful um, silvery underside to its leaf and then sort of nice brown cinnamon uh, top side as it um, as decaying. And these decay very fast. Oak leaves, which we have a lot of, uh, fall. Oak leaves can be a little tough. Um, I like to use these as mulch in the garden, but these could be a little tough. They create that what I call wet newspaper or magazine style, which tend to layer up. So we'll often shred these. And we do this as simply as rake these into a pile, a, a shallow pile, and then run our lawnmower over it. And, and then rake them all up into a pile, or you can, some people will even bag them and set them aside. And they sort of become, start composting a little bit. So by the spring, you have this sort of shredded, um, partially composted leaf uh, mold that can be used in the, in the garden bed and really makes for a nice, fresh garden bed. So here we use that uh, those shredded leaves on this garden bed as we were preparing for spring um, awakening of the perennials that would be in this garden. Whew, a lot to think about in winter and you know soon we'll see this beautiful snows hopefully that'll uh, caress and blanket our garden. It's always good to get a little bit of a snowfall to help insulate our garden. It is also known as poor man's um, uh, fertilizer because there's a lot of nitrogen in that snow, uh, but it's a, it can be really beautiful. Uh, this is the education center where we would have met today. Um, we are planning on doing a little bit of a light show around it, so I do invite you to come check that out. We'll be uh, talking about that very soon. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, are working on what we call a site master plan of Jenkins in looking at how our gardens can be made better. Um, what do we want to protect? I always say, you know, master plans are about recording and protecting, which is already great, but also looking forward to what can we make better for people? How, how can we make better, um, uh, better uh, opportunities to, for people to enjoy the gardens? How can we better articulate our gardens and maybe um, look at different opportunities that are within our gardens. And so I think there's a lot of op a lot of opportunity at Jenkins. It's a beautiful garden, but I think it's ready for a next layer. I always think of Jenkins as it's been a, it's, so, it's something it knows itself like a 20 year old. They often know themselves or getting fresh out of school. They're about to dive into life and uh, they have all this sort of great opportunities. And, and I think Jenkins is really at that point where it's like, how do they, how do we further engage with our community, especially as we look at a changing world, um, especially very prevalent this year and how do we meet and talk 
and relate to people. We definitely have a nice character here. We like talking about um, more of a wild uh, naturalistic style of design and play with that character a lot. Um, it's very important to us that we protect and maintain a beautiful natural woods here and making sure we do that in a sensible way that we don't end up um, hurting the forest, but also we don't forget to replant because these trees aren't going to live forever. So we need to make sure we're providing and producing plants for the future. And then, um, and then looking at the opportunity. So I talked about the Browning property. This is a view onto the Browning property. And this is an area that's currently not open to the public. And can we create, we've been actually playing with a meadow garden down in this area. So could we play and um, design a meadow garden that people could come and meander through and learn about more plants and just, and also just have a beautiful area to have new senses and experiences in. Um, part of that is looking at views. Um, we are in a suburban area, but like I said before, we're on a hillside. Again, the visitor center sits Oops, up here. This is the visitor center here. Here's our pond. Um, this is sort of the open part of the Arboretum right now. So you can see we have a lot more property here. So we're looking at how we can open this area. This was the Browning view that we just saw a minute ago. We were looking from here over. And so how can we open up some of this land? But we have some beautiful views here. And if you haven't been here, um, when you get up on some of these taller, higher areas of our property, you can look out and see Valley Forge in the distance. What you're looking over is what they call the Great Valley. We're in um, to different township and to different is a word for in Welsh known as Great Valley. So even sort of early founders who were sort of setting the boundaries of townships and talking about these areas knew that um, this was an area with this beautiful valley. So Valley Forge sits on one side of it and Jenkins sits on the other side. So we feel very fortunate that we have these great views. Not many gardens in the United States get these beautiful pers uh, perspective views. I invite you to keep checking us out. Visit our website. Um, we're right now offering a lot of our programming virtually. We have a few more things yet this month, but um, we'll be launching a whole new um, program series in January, mid-January that will come out. If you're a member with us, you will receive our printed newsletter in January 2020. As we all know, it's been a crazy year, but we're looking forward to getting back onto a regular schedule of printed media. And we also do, um, we've been doing a lot of things online as well. As I mentioned before, we are doing a little bit of a lighting event. Now, this was a lighting event we did last year, and we did it throughout the garden. We're not going to be able to do it throughout the garden, but we're going to do it up by our visitor center. So that will be starting on December 12th, and we'll be running to the day before Christmas Eve, um, to the 23rd. And we're just staying open a little, like two hours extra uh, for people to come and enjoy those lights. Um, and also check out our Instagram and our YouTube channel or our website. Um, we have a lot of great videos on there that we can, um, that we've been filming since April this year, uh, just talking a lot about different things at Jenkins. We started this because we used to do these Wednesday tours on site, but um, when we couldn't do them this year, we said, let's move it to virtual, and we've had a great following on it, so I encourage you to check those out. Um, as I mentioned, our plant shop will be reopening in April. Um, we've been doing that all outdoors, Plants are outdoors anyways, but we moved our cash register outdoors and been engaging a lot of people that way, but being very socially responsible about that, especially with COVID. So that's been wonderful. Um, and then as a sort of added thing, um, check out uh, America's Garden Capital website, or if you stop at another botanic garden, they often have these passports and they provide information about all the different public gardens in the region. So I encourage you to check that out. We get a lot of visitors who find us because of this. We're not as well known as Longwood or Chanticleer Gardens, but uh, people find out about us by visiting them, picking up this passport. But there's a lot of other amazing gardens in this area that few people realize are out there. And wow, that's all I got. I hope you've enjoyed a bit what I could talk about today. I wanted to sprinkle horticulture in there along with a little bit about news of um, 
Jenkins Arboretum. And I think we're going to take some questions right now. So again, check out our website. And as I mentioned, our Instagram, which is JA Gardens, or you can find us on um, Facebook, or we even, I think, have Twitter, but we mostly do a lot of work on um, our website and Instagram. Thank you so much. Nope, I think you're still, still muted. Mute. There you go. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, your artistic descriptions of the garden just made me want to just visit tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, it just inspired me at different ways of looking at some of the things in my own garden, in my own neighborhood. So we do have a few questions. And Mary asked, is Jenkins surrounded by a deer fence? Yes, good question. So Jenkins is surrounded by a fence. In some sections, it's shorter. It's about six feet tall. Um, but so the fence was installed, if I remember correctly, like something like maybe 10, 15 years ago at a time when deer pressure wasn't as bad as it was now. Um, but we do some sections over six feet, but we have some tall shrubs and deer don't like to jump a fence if they can't see where they're landing on the other side. And other sections of it are eight feet tall, um, which are very fortunate because there are areas that deer would get in. This year, we had a lot of tree damage, as I mentioned in June, and our deer fence got damaged our fence got damaged and we got deer in here. And unfortunately a few of them were fawns and now they're very fond of being here. Um, so we've been struggling with trying to keep them out. They've been finding other ways. We have a stream that runs through the property and they've been finding a way to get in through that stream bed, which has been hard because it's hard to fence off a stream when you have water and debris coming in. Um, but it makes a world of difference. So the few times the deer get in here, you can immediately tell. It really does impact the deer. We do also, um, in our plant shop, when we sell plants, we do talk about deer resistance. And um, we've been doing a lot of experimenting with that in some of our property that's not fenced in. So um, I, our horticulture director, Steve Wright, does a lecture. And I think that lecture might be it was recorded earlier this year and maybe going on our website later on um, that talks about deer resistance. Thank you for that, because I know most of us in this area have a deer problem, so that, that would be great to watch. Um, my question was, is the American Wahoo a native plant? I had never heard of it. It is an American plant. So many of us know of the non-native Euonymus, especially the burning bush Euonymus, but we have two native, um, the strawberry bush Euonymus, I think it was Euonymus americanus, and then the um, uh, Euonymus autopropria, which is the uh, American Wahoo, and they're both native. They're not commonly sold, uh, but we sell both of them here. So um, you can find them in our plant shop when it reopens in April, yeah. I look forward to that. Uh, another question uh, from Judy, are you planning to extend the number of trails for walking in the woods to go forest bathing? Yeah, right now we're, our trails, if you walk all of our trails, it's a little over a mile and a quarter. Um, but we are looking at expanding on our trails in the future. As I mentioned, uh, that Browning property, um, which is adjacent to us, it was given to us in the 1970s. We want to add some trails in that area. And we have some plans of extending a few other trails in the existing Arboretum. Um, partly it's our own um, desire to have people see more of our rhododendron collection. But also I think as, as Judy mentioned, you know, the importance of sort of having those meditative moments in the forest, right? Being in nature and that, that's so important. And Jenkins is, you know, it's a garden. It's not quite, it's a natural area, but not quite just a natural area, right? When you go to a natural area, it's very wild and you have sort of dirt paths you walk on. We have mostly almost all paved paths and we have almost entirely paved paths, and we have, um, it's a little bit more of an organized um, natural uh, woodland experience, so. Well, thank you for answering that, and thank you in general, and I'm sure you'll have many new visitors just for doing this talk for us. Yeah. And now, mm -hmm. <laughs> and now Sandy, would you like to conclude, please?
be able to unmute. There, do you, can you hear me now? You should. I want to thank Tom, uh, not just for giving us that talk, which was very enjoyable, but also for extending uh, the hospitality of Jenkins to us for our meeting. So thank you.